You know, when I began research at University College London with Otto Hutter about 60 years ago, I never imagined that I would end up using Hodgkin-Huxley type models to create a model of cardiac poor kidney fibres. And I certainly didn't imagine that the Cardiac Physiome project would grow into the massive worldwide effort that we see today. The construction of the 1960 or 1962 model led me to some very fundamental interpretations of our science, the science of biology, of physiology. Because, you see, when we create mathematical models for the reconstruction of biological activity, there is a very fundamental fact about those models, which is that there is no solution to those equations without knowing the initial and the boundary conditions that enter into determining all aspects of the context in which a solution to those equations can be possible. That's the first thing that I think is very important. It means, therefore, that biology cannot be simply, as I imagined back then, 60 years ago, it cannot simply be the application of physics and chemistry to biology. Because where do those constants come from? Where do those initial and boundary conditions come from? They come from the rest of the organism. Which means that very naturally there is, in addition to upward causation, the reductive approach, there's also downward causation from all other levels. And this of course is simply an extension of what some of us call the Hodgkin cycle. The Hodgkin cycle, incidentally, which simply looked at the fact that the cell voltage was controlling the protein ion channels, which in turn creates the changes in the cell voltage, I think deserves to be as well known as the Krebs cycle. Many years later, this led me to formulate what I now call the principle of biological relativity which simply states that there is no privileged level of causation in biological systems. Now I come to the second major experience coming from modelling the heart to understanding the basics of biology. Because in the 1980s, when Dario Di Francesco and I worked out how to incorporate changes in iron concentrations and the mechanisms like sodium potassium exchange and sodium calcium exchange that ensure ionic balance, when we came to incorporate those parameters and those mechanisms into the cardiac cell models, we also came across another very important fact. Because as soon as we applied those equations to the origin of rhythm in the sinus node, we made a very important discovery. Which is that when you block one of the mechanisms in a multi-mechanism process, the change that occurs can be so well buffered that instead of finding a very large change in the frequency, which is what you might expect if that mechanism was contributing around 80% functionality to the electric current, instead of that you find only a roughly 10 to 15% change in frequency. That incidentally was the basis of course what, of what led to the a development by the big pharmaceutical company Servier of the very successful heart drug Evabradine. Evabradine works because it can't stop the heart. The pacemaker rhythm is that robust. Now think about it. If a mechanism 
contributes 80% functionality to the overall physiological process, but when you block it or you knock out the gene that codes for that protein and you get only a 10 to 15% change in frequency, what does that tell you about the relationship between genes and function? That's a big error. Moreover, this is general. I found later in looking through the literature on this kind of genetic buffering as we call it, that a group under the team of Helen Mayer just a few years ago systematically worked through single knockouts of most of the 6,000 genes that you find in the little organism yeast. What did they find? 80% of the knockouts are completely silent, meaning there's no change in metabolism, no change in reproduction. Of course, all of those genes are coding for proteins. All of them have function. The point again is that there's sufficiently widespread genetic buffering that led me then to another important thought, which is that the main theory of evolutionary biology developed in the middle of the 20th century relies on being able to use the phenotype as a token for particular genes defined as DNA sequences. The point is that generally won't be reliable. You can even have, as Hillen Mayer and his colleagues showed, a complete knockout with no change in function. Now this has led me into looking into the question whether if that kind of assumption in biology is insecure, a bit of a wobbly plank in the house if you like, how many other aspects of evolutionary biology as we understand it today have wobbly planks in the way in which the house, that is the hypothesis, is formulated. And so I found that there's another very major wobbly plank indeed. It was one constructed by the great quantum mechanician Erwin Schrödinger way back in 1942 when he wrote his little book, What is Life? He made a fundamental error in that book which was the idea that the genetic chemical, whenever it was found, he didn't know it was DNA of course, but when it was found, it would be found to be read in a determinate way, just exactly as you use x-rays to read out the structure of a crystal. That just can't be true. There is massive stochasticity in the way in which the code which we call DNA, is read, and there's massive stochasticity in how it is expressed too. In fact, once again, it is the organism as a whole, the complete cell, that determines whether or not the DNA is reliable and indeed reproduced accurately. That, of course, was the idea, Schrödinger's idea, that led to the central dogma of molecular biology. And that led me too to a further uh, important fact, which is that that dogma, it should never have been called a dogma of course, it's a hypothesis about coding, that should never have been used to back up the general theory of evolutionary biology. So you will understand that I'm now in some deep arguments and debates with many working in the field of evolutionary biology. And what is also certain is you'll be certainly hearing from me again in relation to the impact of computational biology of the kind that we do on the fundamentals of biology concerned with relationship between genes and function and the theory of evolutionary biology.